There's too much of it. And also, way too little. Water just cannot seem to satisfy Europeans. When it rains, drivers in the streets lose their minds as if it were happening for the first time ever in history. And our settlements are often built in a way to try and get rid of rainwater as fast as possible. And yet, when it doesn't rain, drought rears up its head. Precipitation has been steadily decreasing across decades in many regions in Europe, and we don't really seem to have a good solution to it. We want water, and lots of it. We want it readily available at the beach and in our cups, let alone in our factories, but we don't want to give water what it demands of us. Why? How would you like to die? Hopefully not swimming in Donald Canal, although that would be fun. <laughs> Actually, I would prefer to die in Donald Canal. <laughs> I think it would be great to be in, in water and um, turn to Earth. People are building their, their houses in the areas where before were floods. Now they build dikes and if something happened, they're like, oh, that's bad, but you, you, you build it there. It's like, and then you are screaming, there are mosquitoes, but you buy land like in an area where there were wetlands, so you, you know that there will be mosquitoes. Talking with Jakob and talking with the boat companies or not talking with them, which is also a type of communication. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, nice to have spaces that are close by that you kind of ch cherish for what they are and really like maybe don't fly somewhere else but uh, know also that there is a place close by that is beautiful. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Standard Time, the show you watch on your own time because it's digital. Today we dive deep into the topic of water, not just my favorite beverage, but also a living space. I'm Rika Kinga Pop, editor-in-chief of Eurozine, an online cultural magazine presenting this show. Eurozine is also a co-founder of the Display Europe platform. We feature a diverse range of content from across Europe in 15 languages and many more perspectives. Now, water isn't just the stuff you forget to drink eight glasses of every day. It is, without exaggeration, the most important condition for life to exist, both biologically and for societies to form around. We probably should think more about this because our relationship goes well beyond the tap. We've seen cities thrive by waterfronts, wildlife blossom along riverbanks, and communities rally to protect their aquatic homes, yet, and here's the catch, not all have the privilege to access this essential need, and not all bodies of water get to enjoy a peaceful coexistence with the bustling urban life. Oh, and speaking of bustling, did you know that fish in urban waters have been found to have higher levels of anxiety? Yeah, they're too worried about the skyrocketing rent prices under the sea. And let's not get started on the traffic during the upstream commute. Today's guests are Anna Mumladze Detrink, a co founder of Schwimmverein Donau Canal, an urban swimming club in Vienna. Amelie Schlemme is a co founder of Hybrids de Suits, a sustainable fashion brand creating hybrids suitable on both land and water. And from the heart of Bratislava, we have Jakub Zygmunt from Broz, an NGO safeguarding the natural waterways for over two decades. You guys want to use water um, as a public space for humans. And you guys think that humans shouldn't take up all the space from, uh, from wildlife. Can you tell us about revitalizing wetlands, this project of yours? All the organization started when the, the like, heater power plant was built on, on Danube. And there happened many, many things. So basically just the, all the water uh, from the, like we call it, inland delta, which is like under the, the Bratislava, was, was took and sent to the hydropower plant. So before there was like 2,000 cubic uh, meters per second, and now to the like inland delta goes just between 300 and 600, which is like really reduce of, of the flow and everything. And that was like one of the biggest uh, temporarily or all the time flooded uh, wetland. Uh, like in probably in Slovakia and now it's like the water is almost sometimes four meters lower than than before so there was like 
a huge like reducing of wetland species and, and everything. Why are these wetland species so important? When you have mosquitoes, there is something which is eating mosquitoes or is like larvae or like as an adult. And then you are going in the chain higher and higher. And when you take one of the thing from the chain, then it can, like we can end it that there will be just rats and pigeons everywhere. Now that you mentioned pigeons and rats, we have both of those in Vienna, so let's go, let's go over to the other side of, of the border. So tell me, ladies, how did you come up with this idea of swimming in the Donau Canal? Have you always done this? Is this something you like picked up along the lines? Was it ever illegal? Did you have to fight for this? We are swimming where the rats um, and beavers are also swimming. It's in the Donau Canal. And it's um, a side arm of the Danube, which is going through the inner part of the city. It's a cold current that, that runs through Vienna all the time and also in summer when like, a lot of people are searching for cooling down spaces and, and uh, the possibility to yeah, recreate. And the Donau Canal is a great um, resource there, which is ever always there. It's, it's constantly flowing and um, why not you know, activating this um, space with our bodies. That was our question that we asked ourselves uh, three years ago in 2020, when we founded this more artistic um, uh, association in the beginning, which got the title Schwimmverein Donaukanal, which is like a swim club. But actually we are really like lazing, lazy people uh, floating down the current. At the same time, it's not only this individual pleasure but we also really understood that it has political dimensions, it has a lot of ecological dimensions, so it has all these layers, and I think that makes it such an important um, call to do like, um, and to activate this public and, space. Um, to the question of is it legal to swim there, it is legally allowed, but not recommended. That's the position that the state government takes and the city government, if you want to try it, go ahead, um, but be careful. And in that case, you can check our website where we have fact-checked information about safety. So where does this idea come from to you? Did you grow up bathing in the Danube and just insisted on this when you moved to Vienna for university? Or how, where does this come from? I didn't grow up uh, bathing in Danube because I was actually growing up in Tbilisi. I mostly swam near the seaside of Georgia, so that was once a year. I didn't have that much of a connection to water in my everyday life. And then when I moved to Vienna, I actually cannot claim the credit for coming up with the idea, but I think it was so beautiful that um, we could come together around the cause. Then the idea was there from very many different perspectives. So I'm not sure how you came to it, but you can maybe tell us. Yeah, I, I mean, we were researching in general, like the relationship that you also um, addressed um, between the city, the people living in a city and water. And so it was about public baths, for example, that mark a very specific um, um, space in the city where there's very interesting social dynamics around it, very uh, specific codes, like how we behave, how we dress, what is normal there. And it's this kind of semi-public space. And so we kind of just expanded the perspective and broadened it. When you just take a step back and observe the environment that you're in, and then you discover like these, these new options and opportunities, that's really, that's, I think um, that's where it came from together with this water and curiosity. In a consumerist society, like in the center or center east of Europe, this is like self-explanatory that there is water in the tap and there should be water in abundance. But we don't really have that kind of abundance of water and not just because of, of uh, construction projects like the one that you mentioned, but also because heavier and heavier droughts are coming up across the past couple decades. How do you see the connection with the warming of this area, that we have less and less water available? I think that one of the most problems, like maybe in Slovakia, is that the, like the water managers, their, their task is to like, really get rid of the water as fast as possible. So it will not make any disaster. So there, for example, in Slovakia, they are putting stones and cutting out the side branches and putting stones on the, on the beach or on the sides of the river. So the water doesn't have any, like, it just go. It just, like, run 
to the to the ocean so you don't really stop the water that's one of the things where what the this inland delta was doing that the water just just yeah run around everywhere so, so it's supposed to seep in and that should replenish groundwater right yeah. i understand that's not really happening if you don't have wetlands yeah and when you build the the dikes around and you just don't make space for the for the for the water so like it's they go to nil now that they they were waiting for the floods yeah people are building their their houses in the areas where before were floods now they build dikes and if something happened they're like oh, that's bad but you 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 build it there it's like and then you are screaming there are mosquitoes but you buy land like in an area where there were wetlands so you, you know that there will be mosquitoes and now a word from our partner Today we come to you from the Alte Schmiede Kunstverein, a vibrant cultural hub located in the heart of Vienna, Austria. Thanks to them for hosting us. Their program ranges from literary talks and events to concerts, and all of them are free to attend. For a complete list of events and further details, please visit Alte Schmiede's website at alteschmiede.at. So approximately this like past 200 years, in this region is about regulating the rivers because water used to be ever present everywhere so much so that even in the city where i grew up in the east of hungary we had like proper wetlands in the middle of the city next to the house of culture now it's kind of less and less available because we don't have these these water reserves replenishing because we get rid of stuff right because we want to build there or we want to use it for agriculture. But actually agriculture is also suffering from this water management, to my understanding, right? In the south of Slovakia, it looks like in, uh, in Netherlands, there are like many, many channels. And uh, that were built during the like communism when they built the melioration channels. So you dig small channel deeper than around and then you take all the water from there which is really funny because they're taking the water there to this channel and then they're pumping this water to the, to the fields, which doesn't make sense for me. Yeah, it's a lot of interventions into something that would work better if they didn't intervene. And then you have like, when there is rain and if there was a wetland before you destroyed, the soil, it's somehow different. It will not soak that fast. And you are doing, you are pushing so much money to to change it. Would you say it is possible in this extremely regulated, over-regulated um, system to even make changes that make sense? From my point of view, let's take these like, let's call it like nature parks, when you will really just focus on the protection of nature. So let's make one area, do everything what we are saying is important, and then say like, we were right or not. For the sake of nature, environment, uh, biological systems, you have to make concessions, give up something from a civilizational um, sort of comfort point of view. You are immediately expected to show incredible results with just a flick of an eye, you know, with like very little investment. And it is somehow expected of, of everyone dealing with environment to, to do this for cheaper and not hinder anybody's convenience. But when we talk about convenience, I think this really comes in in an urban space, like the Donau Canal from a not yet swimmer's point of view. It's a very pleasant place to walk, to bike, there's trees, there's birds singing, you know, it's like a very nice green space, but it's, it's more of a park. So it doesn't have that kind of like wildlife element. You talked about how you want to change the relationship of the, uh, uh, of the city with the waterways, but how does it change you when you start to closely engage with this body of water? And also in a way that is not usual. I have a very intimate relationship with this water. Mm -hmm. And so through like being maybe in the first place egoistically driven that I can swim there and it's my pleasure, there is some, some anchor points in me that this information comes in, like it can land on something that is for me personally interesting and relevant. And I think that's, that's what we can kind of contribute with this question and also with people that start to, to swim and, and create this relationship with the, with the Donaukanal.
So this relational aspect is really one where when you start and then you're beyond your only personal pleasure, you can really, um, you're interested also in the bigger picture. And I also observed this in me, like this summer, for example, we were in Romania and there was a, like a lot of people that are um, act working in an activistic way uh, with the Danube or also around water quality, like came together there. And like, I was not so much interested in that before, but now I do have like this, 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 knowledge about this place and and all of a sudden like they can like I'm receptive to new knowledge about it So you basically have to learn to be interested in this uh, What you as a member of Schwimmverein Donaukanal um, are constantly trying to do is to negotiate your place to find ways to coexist and also now talking with Jakob and talking with the boat companies or not talking with them which is also a type of communication. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, you, you just see how many stakeholders the rivers have, water bodies have, that mm -hmm. actually, as Amelie was saying, sometimes in the beginning I would look at it as a more rather egoistic, like, oh, let's reclaim it for swimmers. But reclaiming um, by only one group that lives in the city would not be the fair way of doing it. So I think now I always think about it like what would be the new functions of rivers in the cities. Until now, there haven't been many in the recent decades. And how can we kind of co-design it together? Mm, and to that also, we were now recently also in Paris on an urban bathing symposium. Um, and it was really inspiring to see what Paris is doing and how they are looking at the river as they want to be a car-free city. Now they're looking at it as a waterway that can be revived again. And I mean, big companies apparently like IKEA already started with cargo ships like going up and down the Seine River to provide the goods to customers. But that sounds to me like you basically have to reverse engineer a sort of chain of relationships uh, from commercial traffic that now dominates waterways, mm -hmm. um, at least in an urban setting. Do you think, Jakob, that there is a point where humans and, and the natural body of water without big intervention can actually like, coexist? Or is it better if humans just bugger off and leave some space alone and have some other space to themselves for leisure? Well, I think if we really just follow the rules and say like, okay, don't throw the garbage into the water, do this, do this, it's, it, it, will be, it will be better. Like people want to like everything, like our nature is destroyed. Then you build around really nice lake where you want to go swim, you build a house, like your cottage. And then you don't have like this reservoir for uh, like things from the toilet, but you put like small tubes into the lake, which makes the lake dirty but you bought the land because you like you like this <laughs> yes. yeah. this area where we want to swim but you make it dirty i don't understand it but you guys kind of encourage not really playing by the rules or sort of playing around the rules the example that we always follow and we are time after time reassured that this is the best practice in europe is the situation from switzerland in general sense that's the approach we follow um, and especially in this gray zone that we are operating where it's not recommended to swim I think it's even more important to be self-responsible and own the, the thing you do I mean until now we've been I could say really responsible but also as it's we don't have uh, full control over the situation we're not the state we are just a small association so there might be people who started swimming in the canal without having the full information of what we own on the subject. <clears throat> I would really like to add, because it's so nice how you also frame now the self-responsibility, um, because I think the moment that you have laws that are just like, you don't really understand them or you don't see the logic in them, um, like, why should I follow them? And so it's exactly this, um, when, when the city, for example, the city of Vienna, they really, they say like, here, look, this is what we prepared for you. 
and um, now just take it and, and um, have fun with it. And, um, but we will make sure that everything, every danger, every risk is reduced as much as possible. And so, of course, like then, okay, the Viennese, they, as you stated, I think they do like this, uh, following that. But I think in many places, maybe in other countries also, when you don't really see the, the sense of that and you're also not having this tradition of following the rules, you're like, okay, whatever. But if you're more in, like, educated in the, to, to behave self-responsibly, then on the one hand, you, um, you really make your own choices, as you, as you described, plus you maybe additionally um, are interested in, in, in more things and, and you need to understand them also in order to behave correctly. A lot of environmental organization works that they are trying to, to show them what we have as a nature, how we should behave in the nature, but then you, you mostly focus or you read just the people who want that information. Mm -hmm. Then I think there are people, they don't really want them information. That's, for example, like people who are driving by the cars in, uh, in like um, protected areas, which they, they know that it's illegal. They know why it is illegal, but they just w want to do it. Yeah. You can't argue with these people because they don't want to listen. And now, some words from our sponsors, or shall I say, funders and founders the European Commission and the European Cultural Foundation. The European Cultural Foundation is based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, and they have long been keen on connecting Europeans across borders, languages and cultural backgrounds. They've been supporting arts, research and much more since 1954. They also created the Erasmus Student Exchange Programme, which has allowed over 10 million Europeans to travel and study abroad. Now they're bringing together partners from across Europe to build a content sharing platform that syndicates articles, audio and video programs in 15 languages and, somehow, miraculously, also doesn't abuse your user data. Display Europe offers content on politics, culture, community and so much more. It also brings you this very talk show, Standard Time, produced by one of the co-founders, Eurozine. This all wouldn't be possible without the support of the Creative Europe program of the European Union. Thanks, folks. Now let's get back to where we were before. So, um, because water is like at the core of the whole discourse about climate change, right? Do you think that there's like a climate awareness or environmental awareness component to swimming and, and engaging like, you know, in this like old school sense of tourism. Let's say you go to a museum, you go there really with a different um, openness and open mind and open heart maybe also. And um, I think the point is also when you go to a different country, for example, or a different place that you don't know, you also, you go there and you kind of have less of your luggage, of your mental luggage and perspectives that you bring there. Of course, it might be that the, that, the, that the walls are getting even bigger because then the, the people living there complain like, ah, these tourists with their weird uh, opinions and, and what they want to do in my space. And of course, anything could happen in that sense. But, and of course, we are also in an interesting position with the, with the boat companies at the Donaukanal. There's no transport of any kind of goods or, mm -hmm. or stuff. It's really only tourists going up and down on these boats. Also in Switzerland, for example, a lot of tourists I know or people that visited um, uh, different cities in, in Switzerland, they are amazed by this uh, river swimming culture. And for them, it's like really getting something very specific also about that place. And then also the local people feel like, oh yeah, look what we show them. Like we jump with, uh, we put our um, business dress into our um, uh, swim bags and we swim down to our work and tourists find this cool or they, they write about that and, and stuff. So I think um, it like if you catch the right angle, it can be, have a very positive um, effect. And at the same time, of course, like it's uh, nice to have spaces that are close by that you kind of ch cherish for what they are and really like maybe don't fly somewhere else, but uh, know also that there is a place close by that is beautiful. That's maybe the other part of the um, tourism aspect that um, this can cover, you know. Is the relationship of the city and the river very different in Pilisi? 
as we were saying, judging just from like looking at the color of the water, also knowing that there are no centralized wastewater um, cleaning plants, um, I would assume that it is both illegal and not safe to swim in the water um, of the Gwari River. It's quite a um, beautiful river and spans over many countries. Um, there are some other cities in Georgia that have more direct connection to their waters, which is, for example, Kutaisi, the second biggest city in Georgia. It has this beautiful Rioni River. Um, the piers are look more natural. They're not kind of in this concrete walls and um, without any access, actual literal access to the water. So whenever I go to that city, I feel like I can have a more personal relation to, to water. You have also reflooded uh, former wetlands that have been dried up. Is there a community that reacted well to this? I don't know if I mentioned here, but we talked about it uh, before, that all the, in this inland delta, they mostly changed the, the uh, tree species which were grown there from like uh, like poplar, uh, like black poplar or salix or, or this kind of, which you find in the flat fine forest, to the not native one because they're like not making so many branches, they are straight and you can easily, easily uh, change them. Uh, which is also not good for, the, for, the, for anything, but at least they, they also need water. And they're like, for example, there is one guy who is like company in, like in a logging. And last time we met and he was showing us like how to recreate some wetlands because they need the water. Anyway, you, you, like the water will sometimes come there, but because they sometimes buried the, the inflows, so now the water is not there, and they see that they are not able to grow or to plant the trees which will survive. So they see it from the economical, for sure they, they are not because of the any other animals which, which normally lives there, but it's like a good, good start. Like hunters are half-half. It's like everywhere you find people who like understand it and then people who don't like it. Like hunters, they have to go there by cars everywhere. So when there is like everything is flooded, they're not so happy. So it's also depending on the people and, and their knowledge. So it's, it, you can't say like hunters are bad, people from forestry is bad, like it's, it's personal. This program is presented by Eurozine, an online magazine bringing you reads from more than 100 partner publications and across dozens of European languages. This talk show is a Display Europe production, a content sharing platform that offers content on politics, culture, community and so much more. Display Europe also, miraculously, doesn't abuse your user data. Shocker, right? Now, if you like what you see and wish to support our work, please go to patreon.com slash Eurozine that is Eurozine, the magazine presenting this show. You can pledge as little as three euros a month or whatever you can afford. You'll get access to bonus materials, invitations to the taping of the show, and even get to suggest topics and questions. This program is co-funded by the Creative Europe program of the European Union and the European Cultural Foundation. Importantly, the views and opinions expressed here are those of the authors and the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect those of the European Union or the European Education and Culture Executive Agency. Neither the European Union nor the EACEA can be held responsible for them. Mm -hmm.